TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. I mean, we live. Dang, we live. We are live. Tweaking. Uh, by the time you see this, we won't be those. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Remember, twitch.com is where you can catch a live stream. The username's at the bottom of the screen. We also got Twitch, I mean Twitter, or X, whatever you want to call it. That's the same handle as the first one on the bottom of the screen. Um, Patreon, five days a week. And you see the warning behind me, man. I... I, I it's, it's, it's necessary, I believe. This is Inside Modern British Slave Business. Talk to me. Copyright, copyright disclaimer, disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. True. True, true. The wealthy, genteel town of Cheltenham in the Cotswolds. An unlikely place you would think to find slavery. But in recent years, this well-heeled town has been the center of a major slavery investigation. It all began in 2008 with a grisly discovery at the bottom of a garden. My son came across this, what he thought was a football, and he kicked it with his foot to turn it over. And then he found that there were teeth in it, so it wasn't a ball at all. It, and it was actually a human head. skeleton had lain in the undergrowth for three years. Its discovery would expose a world of slavery and horror that most people thought had disappeared two centuries previously. It was just skeletal remains and we had to have DNA abstracted from the bones and then there was a process of DNA profiling which enabled us to identify Christopher. The remains belonged to Christopher Nichols, a father of two from Bristol. He disappeared in 2002 when he was 37. He said to us, I found a new job, Dad. He said, I'm going to work for this lady up in Gloucester to help her as a handyman. He seemed quite happy about it, so we said, oh, fine, you know, keep in touch with us. That was the last I seen of him. Through the bridge there is the house and the garden where Christopher's remains were found. And we were able to establish, once we'd identified him by his DNA, that this place was the last address that he'd lived at. We came to the premises here and spoke to the occupants, who we found to be William and Breda Connors. William Connors, known as Billy, his wife Breda and their children, are an... Not gonna lie, Billy looked like he up to no good. ...Irish traveller family. They own travellers' sites in Gloucestershire and other counties. From their homes, they ran their family business, block paving driveways and patios. Unusually, their workers lived with them. At one point, that included Christopher Nichols. Their tale to us at that time was that in 2005, um, he left to his own volition. He just chose to leave and he went off and they didn't see him again. Our inquiries continued and we were able to identify a friend of Christopher who it turned out had been recruited by the Connors with him and he told a very, very different story. The friend's account was backed up by another man, John, who was held by the Connors for 13 years. He's asked us to hide his identity for fear of reprisals. We went somewhere which was almost like a, an open concentration camp where you were literally made to work and, uh, and punished, you know, on, on a regular basis. I couldn't see any means of getting away or escaping even. Christopher was the Connor's main salesman, responsible for bringing in the lucrative block paving jobs. 
If they didn't get any work um, for the Connors, then often they were subject to violence, and that was typical of the way I'm that... A lot, I'm a lot like at a... At a certain point, you become a real businessman, and, and, and these become your contractors, right? Why not just do it the correct way? You're making a good, you're making a good amount of money. Why not just pay these people? You got the money? That's selfish. That's greed. That's what's the what's the word? Where you think the world revolve around you and nobody else has mattered? They feelings? He's that guy. Whatever it's called. Oh, I forgot the name. That Billy Connors would behave. His actions could be quite extreme. Chris, he'd been beaten with a metal toolbar, which really hurt him badly. I heard the cries. We were all told to stay in our trailers while this was going on. Christopher did try to escape the Connors' clutches. Selwood's inquiries took him back to what was, at that time, Billy and Breeder's home. He left the premises in the middle of the night and for some reason stepped out into the road and been hit by a, a passing vehicle and sustained very serious injuries, which uh, resulted in, being, in him being hospitalised. Christopher's hospital stay was abruptly cut short when Billy Connors and his worker John paid him a visit. Chris looked absolutely terrified. But when we seen him, he looked very poor, he was very bruised, not well at all, and can't get out of the bed. But the object of the, the visit, apparently, was to get him from there and take him back to the site where he would be put back to work. I couldn't believe Straight that, off that the injury. really taking place. I was convinced that my boss was a psycho. It's totally inhuman. Christopher returned to Billy and Breeder, but the accident had left him incontinent and unable to work. Four months later, he disappeared. It would be the last anyone would see of him. We were just told that he'd gone. He'd, they'd moved off. One minute he was there, the next minute he was gone. What had begun as a case of unidentified That's human remains up. was now overshadowed by alarming tales of slave-like conditions at Billy Connor's sites. So Detective Superintendent Selwood decided to put the Connors under surveillance. And very quickly, almost every day we did surveillance, we saw workers leaving one or other of Billy's sites, going off to work on driveways. They worked in all weathers. That winter was a particularly cold winter with snow on the ground. They'd clear the snow and they'd carry on block paving and digging. They worked from dawn till dusk. Billy and Bree I feel like dawn in the UK is very early. Ida drove their workers and around dusk the is clock, very late. 19 hours a day, six days a week, for as little as five pounds, or no pay at all. The men were given so little to eat, they were reduced to scavenging for food in dustbins. And there was more graphic evidence of Billy Connor's brutal treatment of his workers. We captured a number of assaults, and these images show Billy Connors here kicking and here punching uh, a 17-year-old worker on his site at Beggar's Roost. You gotta, like... What type of manipulation or hold did he have over them where they just didn't leave when they were doing the work? At some moment, they had to be a lapse in security when they was out doing a job. They could have just dipped, right? I'm just putting out the question. I'm curious. This image is the youth in tears afterwards. One of the workers we established was more or less a personal slave for Billy and Breeder. I've seen him hit about with a broom until his head has bled. I've seen him all his clothes removed and then hosed in cold water in uh, the middle of winter. Really um, awful. 
the police did not want to rely on the testimony of vulnerable men to prosecute the Connors. Luckily for Selwood, new anti-slavery legislation was about to come into force, the first for 200 years. Now he would need proof that the Connors had gotten rich off the backs of their workers. Alongside our covert investigation, we ran a financial investigation. And we identified assets that we say were valuable. Like, you gotta understand, like, in this underground world of thievery and, and misconduct and blah, 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 there's a, there's a date. There's not an exact date, but there's, a, there's gonna come a point where you have to have an exit plan. I've made X amount of dollars. Okay, I can go re legit and start paying people. Like, valued at over half. When they get to finding bones and stuff, you, you, your ending is coming. Two and a half million pounds. We identified bank accounts with nearly 600,000 pounds on deposit. We identified they had a luxurious lifestyle. Their caravans and their homes were luxurious. They always drove top-of-the-range vehicles. They went on expensive holidays. We had evidence of them going for cruises on the Queen Mary, exotic holidays in America and in Europe. And they lived a very high life. With new slavery legislation in place, Selwood was ready to act. On the 22nd of March, 2011, he made his move. One hundred and fifty police officers swooped on three sites belonging to Billy and Breda Connors. The couple were arrested, along with their two sons and son-in-law, Miles. You are making people work in conditions that amount to slavery. That's the reason you're being arrested. My life, my whole life. Hey. Slavery, my husband, slavery. I cannot believe what he's getting arrested for, love. What, for who? Who's the slavery? Well, I come in, is that all right? Yeah, no problem. 16 men were rescued. One of them was John. He'd been enslaved by the Connors for 13 years. Remember. A knock on the door. Constable there, lady constable was there. She said, I want you to get your things together. You, you, you come outside and get a halitian, I think. The 16 rescued men were taken away to a safe house in Cheltenham. One man had been held by Billy and Breda Connors for more than 30 years. 30 These years? Workers were... I'm sorry. 30 years? At, th at 30 years, you're good and brainwashed. I'm not, come on, man. I'm not, I don't want to victim blame because y'all be telling me I be victim blaming, but like 30 years? Slaves. They were under our noses to a degree. This has been going on for decades in Gloucestershire. We were completely oblivious to it. These people had just disappeared. They didn't exist. And the Connors were able to exploit them. For decades, the Connors family had scoured towns and resorts across the UK looking for potential slaves. So they were looking for high risk people who didn't, like high risk people from other places, people down on their luck, thirsty. The South Coast was a favorite hunting ground for picking up vulnerable British men. Oh, so this was British men but still vulnerable, down on they luck, thirsty for work. September 2009, Bournemouth. Mark Ovenden had just lost his job, and he was struggling to make ends meet. I experienced some hardship. I started to feel very depressed. I, I was, um, I withdrew myself, I isolated myself. I was living in a house that was, uh, that was due to be sold. Lost a job. I was on the very edge of destitution. But Mark's situation was about to take a turn for the worse. It was an uh, evening in late September 2009, and I was just heading up to the soup kitchen here. 
Um, there's a guy parked outside on this corner with, um, he was in a fairly nice car. He had his, um, his wife and his kid with him. And um, he asked me if I was looking for a job, said he could throw in his, throw in accommodation, three meals a day. And I thought, why not? And so I I'll be telling people, man, when stuff sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true, 100%. If you listen to that instinct, even if you don't have an instinct, just listen to these words. When it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Period. With him there and then. So you telling me I don't gotta grind, I don't gotta work my way up, I don't gotta do nothing, I just come work for you and I've achieved everything. Mark had been picked up by another member of the Connors family. He was driven to a traveler's site called Green Acres, on the outskirts of the market town of Leighton Buzzard. This site belongs to Tommy Connors, a cousin of Billy and Breda. It wasn't until the next day that I noticed that anything was particularly wrong. The other workers at the site were living in a horse box. It would have been about eight living in a horse box, which had kind of wooden bunks built into the side of it. Uh, you've seen the pictures of um, kind of the concentration camps, the long tunnel-like barracks, and it looked exactly like that inside. It wasn't just the living conditions that troubled him, but the inmates themselves. People would have their heads shaved. Everybody at the site had a shaved head. This ritual was carried out by one of the other long-serving workers. I've done it. I had to do it to people. Cut their hair, do you come the bully? As part of the initiation, the new recruit's own clothes would be taken away. They lowered you down, breathing cold water. I know stuff like this is going on around the world, unfortunately, but when you see it, it's hard to, like, process it. Like... To me, any this documents, is insane. any mobile phones, anything like that, anything valuable would be taken away. But at like, this point, what was going through your head, brother? Like at this point, what did they say to you? Like what? <laughs> like you was just like, all right, never mind. I'm just gonna let it see how it play out. Type energy. When I was first Question picked up, mark. my house keys and my mobile phone disappeared. It's of all your ID and everything to know that you didn't exist. There was one outside tap for the workers to use, cold water only, and this is approaching winter now, so it's not ideal at all. Most of them hadn't showered or cleaned themselves for a couple of months at least. There was a, kind of a small outside toilet that didn't work. You had to go over them. Wall. For months? Do you know, as a man, one week without a shower after you've like done like some like activity, crazy hard work, the skin on your lower extremities is like very susceptible to like it get dirty, sweaty, like it gets itchy, like no, 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 okay, not. I understand that they were in predicaments, but... It's all the cars, you know what I mean? You, sh you know what I mean? You don't wipe your ass. You have to go over the wall to have a cars, you know what I mean? You, sh you know what I mean? You don't wipe your ass. So this is Green Acres. It's an odd feeling to be back here. Um, I spent what was the worst period of my life here. He tore the whole thing I down. was definitely kept a prisoner. There weren't any locked gates or bars or anything like that, but I was. it was made very, very clear that if I was to go out, if I was to try to leave, then the consequences would be pretty grave. I've seen Tommy Senior punch people, kick people, push people around, threaten people's lives frequently. I was shot many a time. Oh, I hit me somewhere, or kicked. He said, if you ever escape the lot, we'll find you. We'll find you, killed you, and you could have buried you at the back of the fields. 
So was it worth escaping? If I stay, I'm already dead inside. Me personally. So yeah, it would have been worth it for me. I gotta, I gotta do, I got to. You don't really see escape as an option. You know that wherever you go, you're going to be found. Here, I'm some 120, 130 miles from home. I uh, didn't have any money in my pocket. Um, didn't have any reason to suspect that the authorities would take me seriously if I went to them. Um, so where was I going to go? I'd leave here and have to walk any number of miles in any... Why wouldn't the authorities take you serious if you come to... Th That's probably something they had brainwashed them with. ...direction, I'm going to be fairly easy to pick up again. In July 2011, two workers did manage to escape while out canvassing for work and went to the police. I went canvassing, uh, canvassing. Wait, go back. ...went to the police. Two workers did manage to escape while out canvassing for work and went to the police. I went canvassing, uh, canvassing all day. I didn't get one customer. So, he punched me in the eye be, as hard as he could. He goes, you're useless. So I punched me in the eye and put me in the boot of the car. And it was all dark and they were all covered. And it's not very nice going in the boot. He told us of incidents of uh, beatings and mistreatment. People were being starved. And that if anybody did try to escape, they would be beaten and even killed. Right, and I assume with this information, y'all investigated immediately and relocated this person. So if you try and then, what can to murder you? And he then says that there's another man in the area doing the same, who's been held against his will for over seven years. When the police found him, he said, nah, everything's fine. The corners are my best friends now. They're like my parents. I've enjoyed life for the last seven years. I'm off the, I'm off the alcohol, thanks to them. We've had some information to suggest that you're beaten regularly. Not really. Not slaps. really. A few slaps. Why would I'm not. Why would anyone slap you? Maybe. I you gotta realize, like, you gotta really read between the lines. A grown man telling you somebody is like their parents. It's a little sketch. I deserve it. Why would you deserve it? I don't know. Maybe I do deserve it. Dang. So if they had two. That's that's crazy. Two different accounts, and this is what we knew we would face throughout the investigation, people that would say, yeah, everything was fine, because they're that vulnerable. There was no barbed wire, there was no um, fencing, there was no need, because they were all brainwashed. Anyway, for seven years, uh, my life has been fantastic. In September 2011, 200 police officers descended on the Connors site at Greenacres. You see two caravans in the van. And uncovered a world of squalor and horror. You had these poor people in pitiful dress, thin, pale, teeth missing, filthy, dirty, heads down, broken men. That's real sad, I ain't even gonna lie. The only clothing they had was what they were wearing. Some had scurvy. One guy was covered from head to foot in his own excrement. It was the most dire, disgusting place you could ever wish to live in. They had to have the travellers' cats and kittens living in there with them. Cats were urinating and defecating in there, and they had to live in there. And you see the poo on the floor, and you see that they're, they're living amongst that. 
They're just horrific, really. These conditions were in stark contrast to the Connors' homes, just a few metres away. People would refer to it as palatial. Really nice kitchens, sparkling clean, often unused, with crystal in the, in, in the ovens to show how clean and tidy it was. Luxury everywhere. So that was, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is Chanel in a trailer home? Or like, what is. When we searched the caravans, there was a stacking like steamer set cash in the bottom part of the pan and there was a, a baby bag stuffed with money lots of ready cash lying around we're talking yeah, there was in there over capping thousands in the pot we're not talking a, a, a few pennies or a hundred quid or so by the end of the raid officers had rescued 22 men that was one of the greatest days of my life <sighs> it was the world just stopped it went Choo! and the air smell smells different. That's how good it was. But for others, freedom after years of mental imprisonment was not welcome. Some people still refused to leave. This man had been with the Connors for 20 years. They reckon I was a slave, yeah. And so do they question you about your involvement here? They, they tried to question me, but I told them that I'm not going into an interview. There's no slaves here. They, 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 if they were slaves, they would go. People go and come when they want. I'm not even going to say nothing because this is a crazy documentary, man. I just want to remain professional. There's no slaves here. Five members of Tommy Connor's family were arrested and charged with slavery. Did you ever? offer any violence to them, did you beat them? Or no comment. Them? Or injure them in any way? No comment. Anything that you want to comment on at all, Patrick? I mean, what I'm doing in this police station, mm -hmm. work hard for a living, don't do anything wrong. It's just another thing to get back at our family again. But what do you, what do you work hard doing for a living? The, the interview's over now, I just conclude what I have to say, that's it. No comment. Are these human beings that have to live in that? They should tidy it then, shouldn't they? Oh. Did you not tell them to? I can't, can't force people to do things. Well, you force them to go out and work no. for you. I didn't force them. Four members of Tommy Connor's family were convicted of slavery and sentenced to a total of 28 years in prison. Not even gonna lie, that don't seem like that much. Billy and Breda Connors and three of their family were jailed for nearly 19 years in total. They were also ordered to pay two and a quarter million pounds immediately. When you see him in the handcuffs, with the red bow down, guilt, and you knew my time has come. For the family of Christopher Nichols, whose skeletal remains sparked the initial investigation, there is no closure. The police were unable to find any evidence to link his death to Billy Connors. Billy Connors said he'd given him 50 pounds and sent him on his way. Well, my own view is that Christopher was no longer of any use to Billy Connors because of the physical injuries that he'd sustained, and Billy threw him out to fend for himself, and I think Christopher would have had the clothes he stood up in. There was a few bloody take men, and if you couldn't use them any longer, perhaps they were gone past the cell by date where work was concerned, they would be flighted, yeah, basically take, taken to any part of the country and just dump there. We do have his children. That's messed up. And it's uh, very sad, really, that they've had to suffer in such a way. So we're saying that they just dumped them in a random part of the country instead of saying that we uh, possibly disposed of them, leaving, trying to leave no paper trail type energy. We don't believe that we'll get justice for the death of Christopher. The cause of Christopher's death remains a mystery, but without it, 
many of his co-workers would never have gained their freedom. What would you say to Chris if he was still here? I'd probably put my arms around him and I'd hug him. I can't thank him enough. Really. Thank you. Four members of... Greed, man. Greed, money make you do some stuff that is unhumane to people. Connor's family may be behind bars, but for many of their victims, the fear remains. It's been six years since Mark Ovenden escaped from their clutches, but he still doesn't feel safe. I went into the center of town one day and I was about to cross a road. I was standing at a pedestrian crossing and a white transit van pulled up next to me. And there was a red-headed guy who sat in the driver's seat. And I panicked and ran off. I still couldn't shake PTSD. the feeling that anything could happen at any point. It's understandable. What happened to the Connors victims is not an isolated case. Every day in the UK, people are being targeted by slave drivers. This is very much the tip of the iceberg. This isn't a traveler crime. This is something that's happening everywhere in the UK. In 21st century Britain, slavery has taken root in every town and city. In June 2016, the High Court found that a subcontractor used slaves to catch chickens for a leading supplier of eggs to high street stores, unbeknown to the supplier or retailer. Lately, Britain's nail bar industry has come under scrutiny. We've seen a massive growth in the last two years of nail bars popping up up and down the high street. You can get your nails done for £10, but you can only pay in cash. The person that's doing your nails can't speak any English. And often what we're beginning to find is that they're held there against their will. They're enforced. Wow. The nail technicians? Labor situation, and they're often in bonded debt to their slave masters. So the question is, who's doing your nails? Are your nails being done by slaves? Many nail salons are staffed by trafficked Vietnamese who are being lured here with the promise of well-paid jobs. A favorite destination is Scotland. The police here now carry out spot checks on nail bars across the country. This customer is bemused by the sudden police presence. Do you come here often? Um, I've been here a couple of times. Yeah, do friends come here as well? Yeah. Any concerns? Um, I think we get it done. Yeah. Change over the staff? Um, a wee bit, yeah. Yeah, okay. I've had a few different people coming in. Yeah, okay. All right. I've got officers outside. Do you mind if we just have a quick chat with you? Just yeah, very, very briefly. Okay, thank you. One of the team has spotted a new worker in the corner of the shop who has raised his suspicions. Nice to meet you. Um, we're just going to go into this office and I just want to have a very brief uh, chat with you. Hi, how you doing? Hi, nice things. How did you arrive here? What was the journey? Cái hành trình đi từ đâu? Mình xuất phát từ Việt Nam nhưng mà mình không nhớ chính xác là đi qua bao nhiêu nước và phải đổi xe bao nhiêu lần, ừ. bởi vì đổi xe rất là nhiều lần. Chưa nói gì hết. Không nhớ rõ được, không nhớ rõ địa chỉ đâu. Just remember exactly the address. No. We could meet people and they don't know that simple question of where they actually are is horrendous. They don't speak any um, English at all, so they have no understanding um, of what situation they're in or how to get themselves out of that situation. Can you ask him who has his identity card? Thế cái uh, giấy chứng minh thư nhân dân của anh thì ai cầm? Ừ, không, mình không có. Ngay từ khi sinh ra mình không có. I never have any identity card. Do you pay enough? Có. Yes. Mình, mọi người ở đây, thứ nhất là mình đến đây vừa học vừa làm này, nhưng mà vẫn có lương. Thứ hai là người ta còn cho mình ăn ở đây, rất là thoải mái. Mm -hmm. Can you ask him if he owes any money? Có nhưng mà không nhiều, mình không cần. Not theo much. Mình. Not much. Mm. How much? The boy is just 16. He's worried that he's said too much and he's going to be deported.
believe that nail shop is no longer with us, that nail salon. The boy was taken to a place of safety. Right. British police tracked down the owner of the nail bar to a London suburb, 420 miles away. Bro was nowhere near what was going on. Yeah, definitely. In September, he was convicted of trafficking offences and was sentenced to 12 months in prison. Twelve months for trafficking? Ain't R. Kelly in jail for trafficking too? Didn't he get like 12, 30 years? Or the plight of migrant workers of all nationalities is echoed in towns in rural areas across Britain. 3 a.m. Cambridgeshire. 300 crime officers are about to raid properties in Wisbeach. They're targeting illegal gang masters who exploit migrants desperate for work. Come on, come on, get in there! Get in there! Let's go, please! Every day before dawn in Wisbeach, a modern British ritual plays out. Eastern Europeans gather in the town centre looking for a day's work. Wisbeach as a town has always attracted migrant workers because of the type of work that's available. It's largely agricultural. This happens in uh, here too a lot. I, I swear I've never seen it up per in person until I moved to Florida. I, I've seen it in movies and things of that nature, but it's, when I moved to Florida, I used to live a, around the corner from a Home Depot every morning. I would go to drop my daughter off to school and I'd come back, Home Depot parking lot, deep. I'm talking deep. I'm like, damn, what? The? <laughs> and I used to see people come and jump in. I was like, oh, it's crazy. Culture, it's largely hard labor on minimum pay, and the indigenous population's just not been attracted to that type of work. These are the lucky ones. They're picked up by legal gang masters. The work is tough, but they're paid the going rate, and it's all above board. Across the road, it's a different story. There's a parallel operation with ruthless, illegal gang masters, exploiting migrants for little or no pay. This is where an Eastern European crime gang picked up its workers. In their raids, crime officers find 80 workers who were taken away to safety. Harm your defense. If you do not mention one question, something you later on, I thought. They also arrest nine members of organized crime gangs. Yeah, Among them, they get one of their targets, Latvian man Ivar Zmezl. Oh, oh, no, 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 man. Don't cry now. Uh-uh. No, nah, we don't want to see that. <laughs> we don't want to see no tears, buddy. You do the crime, you got to do the time. Get your ass, you going to jail. It's over. The jig is up, buddy. I don't give, I don't want to see no tears out of you. They get one of their targets. Latvian man, Ivar's Zmezels. Then cry ugly. Come on now. Don't ugly cry. Money, hey. This was the end of a year-long investigation by Cambridgeshire Police, targeting a crime gang led by Mezels and Yuris Valuevs, and including Valuevs' wife, Oksana, and her friend, Lauma Vankova. Ivar's Mezels was extremely calculating. He was really able to understand vulnerability, to identify those that could be exploited. Okay, so this is the exhibits room. Here we have some adverts which were found at uh, the home addresses 
and they're written in Russian um, and they've translated to workers required to work cabbages, potatoes and flowers. And the two telephone numbers there refer to Valuevs and Mezels. The adverts were placed in shops and on social network sites designed to target Eastern Europeans dreaming of a better life. Mezzles was guaranteeing each individual work. If you come from an area where work isn't available, you don't have good living accommodation, come to me in Wisbeach and I'm going to guarantee you good employment, regular employment, above the minimum pay. You're also going to get accommodation, it's going to be good accommodation and I'm going to look after your interests. The reality was very different. Workers were crowded into dilapidated homes for which Mezzles charged extortionate rents. We entered here at four o'clock this morning and we found seven males and one female. And when we were let in through the back door, there was a, two males actually asleep, sitting down with the feet up on each of these chairs here. Um, they were just slept there. They had literally only just arrived. They'd been just literally dropped off by someone and saying, this is where you're staying, drop them off and then drove off. First bedroom, you've got damp going all the way along the top, all the way around. And if you look, you can see the discoloration. On mm, terrible living conditions, man. Mold everywhere. It's a bad respiratory situation. In the wall. Damp all behind the beds. It's coming all the way up. The plaster's actually coming away from the wall. And, that, and that's somebody's head um, steeping right next to it, which I wouldn't think is going to be very good for your health. At all. It seems that people have been exploited. It's quite unnerving, really, that this is going on so close to home. Mezzles and the gang sublet eight such houses, generating around £10,000 a month in rent. But it wasn't enough. He also overcharged for transport to the fields and factories where migrants would find that the promised work just wasn't there. But they still owed mezzles for their transport and rent. And now they were in his debt. Over here, we have one of the debt books that we seized from mezzles. It was actually in his car. Now inside, as an example, you'll see rent, transport and debts recorded within this book. OK, this is a transport column. So there's dates at the top here. Um, and you can see that one person has been charged £8 a day for transport. Somebody else is £7. So they were earning very low amounts of money. And if you add up the money that they, they earned and you take away the rent and you take away the transport and you take away what Mezzel says was a debt, they were left with a pittance very often at the end of that. Sometimes pence, sometimes nothing at all um, and earning nothing for all of their effort. Wow, man, that's a whole lot of greed. This is messed up on every level. During the course of level. their investigation, Cambridgeshire police discovered that Mezzles and the gang ruthlessly exploited their workers for profit. Once the workers were uh, in debt, basically having no earnings at all, worried about keeping the roof over their head and where their next meal was going to come from, they'd do essentially whatever they were asked to do. And they were asked to go with the gang into banks and building societies and told they were going to be opening bank accounts. The gang themselves acted as an interpreter and convinced the banks that they were just there to assist their friends and colleagues. When the bank accounts were opened, they went immediately into the control of the gang and were used by the gang to launder money. On one occasion, a young lady we worked with. So not only was they manipulating them in, into working for free, they were laundering money through. That's Throughout the trial, called Santa identified that more than £11,000 had gone through her account. So she confronted Valuevs and Valuevs essentially told her not to ask questions and he said um, that he would finish her off. The gang singled out female workers for more sinister exploitation. Women in particular are a very valuable commodity for the gang. They could use them to enter them into sham weddings or they could push them towards prostitution. They also threatened them with much 
more serious things like if you don't pay me back, you can sell an organ, which then made the sham weddings and prostitution sound far less scary. And one of our victims in particular, she was coerced into going to India, where on her return, after marrying somebody in India, I was told by the gang, you're no further use to us, you've cleared your debt, and they evicted her and her children from the house. Over the course of two trials, Messels and Valuevs were finally convicted. First, they were found guilty of operating as illegal gang masters. Don't drop it. Then in May 2016, all four gang members were convicted of conspiracy to acquire criminal property. Three of the four were also jailed for arranging sham marriages. The gang was sentenced to 26 years in prison, but other criminal Total? groups are still working the area. Cambridgeshire police are currently investigating six other cases involving labor exploitation. Today, officers are on their way to check on the gang's former workers. Following the police investigation, many found themselves homeless. We're now en route to an encampment. Initially, when we first met them, they wouldn't tell us who they were working for. Yeah, they are very much uh, afraid of mentioning um, Ivar's and uh, Urius's name. Very fearful to talk about them for fear of reprisals. The makeshift camp is situated just yards from a busy main road. The conditions are squalid. The living area here, undercover, um, with their chairs, got a little table in there, their drinks. I got these in Florida too. Along the train tracks, I see them. When I used to take the train, I seen them. This is the, uh, the red carpet that leads to the, uh, the toilet area. Um, it's a bit of a makeshift uh, toilet we've made, made out of tyres. Not the most comfortable, but um, it's out of the way from the main camp. There are three people huddled under a tarpaulin tent that barely protects them from the elements. Hello? There's no problems. We're just checking that you're OK because it's been a cold night. We just no want to check you. Kim with them. Please, can you leave us alone? We really, we, we're not touching anyone. Would you please leave us in, in peace? They're initially reluctant to talk to the police. They only agreed to speak on the assurance that we would hide their identities. You, in the past, have told us that you've had problems with people ta or with money being taken from your pay. This man worked for another illegal gangmaster. They told me I have to, to pay money to them. They were taking 500 pounds. You work for Euros and for Eva's Mezzles? Because you probably have people. no problems. Every day I drive in cars and I close Eva and Euro. Было, было, было работа, было все, было, было машины, каждый день работа была. Every day we had work. Я и то дом был, касание хата было, все было. Everything's right. Спасибо. Thank you. Mezel's gang may be in prison, but the workers still are still scared. afraid of them. Word has gotten out that if there's a camera, then you you fully support Ivars and 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 Uris. It's just amazing that in, in 21st century Britain, we've, we've got people living in tents. It's outrageous and there's people profiteering from it um, and making the vast, vast sums of money whilst other people are left in, in these conditions. Um, it's words fail me, really. on the streets of London, as in our other major cities, organized crime gangs target vulnerable men and women for slave labor. 
I'm out tonight to warn the homeless that the Yeah man, this is a different section of the game. I don't know nothing about this. This is this is not honorable at all. This is morally unfathomable for somebody like me. Risk of becoming victims of human trafficking. Hi, how are you? Charity worker Megan Stewart used to be homeless herself. She's made it her mission to spread the word about the trafficking gangs who lie in wait. The situation on the streets is definitely getting worse than what it's been. The reason traffickers seem to be targeting the homeless at the moment is because obviously it costs money to come in uh, from Europe to the UK. Why bring people in when they're already here at the soup runs? I'm here, yeah, because the free food banks where you guys are accumulating are being targeted by human traffickers. If you could give me the details of any vans or suspicious people, yeah, I, hear, uh, I can work. A couple of months ago, uh, they took them a couple of their guys somewhere like far. Yeah. I haven't seen them. The traffickers have learned about the soup runs and they've also learned the rota of the soup runs, where the soup runs are going to be, who's going to be at those soup runs, and they basically become a candy store for the traffickers. The more vulnerable they are, the more likely they are to be targeted. So if you don't speak any English, if you're looking forlorn or you're a drug addict or alcoholic... That's like a drug addict going... That's like, that's like a trapper going outside of a AAA meeting or something. Or... Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's diabolical. That's the type of person that the traffickers are looking for. Someone that's not going to be missed. They go out, they say to them, um, I was sitting in this queue last week. These guys came along, they offered me work and accommodation. I've not looked back, mate. And they've got a couple of openings. So, you know, the, the guys, because they're cold, because they're hungry, think, Jesus, great, get in the van, and that's, that's it. There are takers for these offers, as Megan hears from a homeless girl. A couple got in my car last week. Who did? A couple of two okay. of and a guy, and they got offered work and accommodation, and they got in the car. Listen, heed my message. If you can <laughs> spread it, if it's too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. No, I can't and you've not seen them since? No. Please be careful. Have you ever been approached yourself? Aye. By it? Aye. We knew it was a scam. We just went, nah, forget it, mate. You know what I mean? We are not interested. Right. We know what happens when people go with the likes of you, as I say, end up in a shallow grave somewhere. Indeed. If it's the worst case yeah. scenario. Aye. Indeed. It's not just a British problem. The UN says the slave trade is a huge money-making global enterprise. It's a $150 billion a year industry. $150 billion. $150 bill? Would it be? This is serious organized crime on a scale the world hasn't seen before. Drugs are massive, huge industry, but you can only sell drugs once. People can get sold over and over and over again. With new modern slavery legislation in force, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, has made it her mission to crack down on the slave masters. It's a huge challenge. People tend to be very comfortable with where they are and they tend to forget that it doesn't really take much for your life to take a downturn. It doesn't take much for you to lose a home or, you know, lose a job or become depressed or whatever. I just happen to be one of those unlucky people that it, that it happened to. But it can happen to anybody. Anybody to. think it can. It's just become so commercial. It's become so entrepreneurial. So it's almost starting to embed itself at such a low level that it's become normal and we have to change attitudes. However big we think the problem is, I don't think it's naive to think that we can end modern slavery in our lifetime. But it comes down to each and every one of us. So when we go shopping, who made the product? It's crazy how many problems the world has as a whole.
that will not ever end in our lifetimes or the next one. Who's serving us? Who's cleaning our car? Who's doing our nails? Who's tarmacking our drives? And we just need to stop and ask ourselves, do we want to live in a world still built on the back of slavery? No. Tell or leave a like comment. I'm gone.